What is going on guys? We are back and today we are going to be doing a mod spotlight on the relatively new magic mod Eidolon. Now this mod was developed by the mod author Elucent, who is also the mod author of both the Roots and Embers mod, which I thoroughly enjoyed. So I'm super excited to see how this mod pans out as it is still currently in development. It was released in late 2020 and the mod author has tons of plans for future content to add to it. But as you can see, we're gonna be going over a ton of different stuff today. So there's more than enough right now to say it's a pretty well-rounded mod. That's a ton of fun to mess around with. And there's a lot of reasons that it's beneficial to actually get into this. Now, one of the best things about this mod, in my opinion, is that it comes with great in-game documentation. So what I'm holding right now is the book that you'll be able to make relatively early on with all the info in it you could possibly need. It's known as the Ars Ecclesia, and you're going to be able to make it by using a book and a piece of rotten flesh. And if we open it up, you can see that there's a couple different chapters here you can go through. We'll be covering all this information today. It starts out with natural phenomena, goes to rituals, artifice, theurgy, and finally mystical signs, covering pretty much everything you need to know. But it's 2021, and as we all know, the movie is always better than the book. So of course, you should obviously watch this video instead of reading this dusty old thing. Um, but in seriousness, there are a lot of reasons to watch the video, specifically because you discover a lot of things in this mod as you progress, and there's a lot of things you may not know how to discover in terms of the different uh, theurgy you know, things, the mystical signs. A lot of things are left blank in here, and so we'll be going over how to actually discover all of those things on top of covering all the things that are already listed in here. So as always, there will be timestamps in the description so you can skip ahead if you want to go to a specific section because you need info on one thing but if you also just want to watch this all the way through and hear about how cool of a mod this is and all the different stuff you can do that's great too so to jump into it we're going to start by going over the different world generation things and stuff you might run into if you don't really plan on messing around with this mod but are playing in maybe a mod pack that includes it and you're just running around in the world now it adds two different mobs to the game and they're pretty cool. The first one is right here. This is going to be the zombie brute. And as you can probably tell, it's just a larger buff version of a zombie. So it's going to be twice as strong, it's gonna be twice as fast, and it's going to have double the health of a regular zombie. So suffice to say, you really don't wanna run into this guy early on without some good armor, but nothing else too special about them. They're going to drop rotten flesh, occasionally bone, and if you're lucky, a zombie heart, which will come in handy later. So if you find one of those early on, you're definitely gonna to wanna to hang on to it if you plan on messing around with this mod in the future. Now the next thing is I think even cooler, and this is a Wraith. And this mob's a little bit different because it is a floating one, which means that it can go over liquid, making it uh, a little bit of a weird one compared to a lot of other monsters in the game. But when you're also fighting this, it will apply the chilled debuff to you and you'll be able to see it because your hearts will change color and that will make it so that you cannot receive healing from any source. So suffice to say, you really don't want to end up fighting this guy and a couple other guys as you're gonna have a really tough time and probably lose your health pretty quickly. Now this guy will drop Tattered Cloth and also a chance of dropping its own heart when you kill it. And again, that's something you're gonna to wanna to hold on to as it will be used in crafting and things later down the line in this mod. Now on top of adding in a couple new monsters, it's going to also add in a new ore to the game that spawns relatively similar to gold ore, both in terms of frequency and Y level, and that is going to be lead. Now you can see the texture for it right here. I think it looks absolutely awesome. I really like this color, and this is what the ingot's going to look like. Unfortunately, you really don't use the lead ingot itself for anything other than making the new alloy that's also added into the game by Eidolon, and that's right over here. And this is going to be the pewter ingot, and so you are going to make this by combining lead with iron. You're going to get the blend of it, and then you're going to cook that down, and you will get the pewter ingot. Uh, I also think this one looks pretty cool. You can see the blocks for it right here. And this is going to be one of your main crafting materials for a ton of the stuff that will come down the line in this mod. So it's not gonna hurt to collect a fair bit of lead and just turn a bunch of it into pewter for future use. 
Now, one of the last generic things that is added into the game is going to be Enchanted Ash, and you can see that on the ground right here. You also probably noticed it around the Wraith early on over there, and this is a relatively simple block made by cooking down bone, and you can place it on the ground. It looks very similar to string, and it is going to prevent undead creatures from crossing it. So this will be very handy for a lot of different reasons. Uh, obviously, as you can see here, it'll be great for protecting you from some bad guys, but it's also going to be very useful as a lot of the rituals and things down the line are going to require you to have trapped undead creatures nearby and so this will make it a lot easier to not be you know running in circles around where you're casting the ritual and instead you can actually trap them and simply leave them there until you've conducted your ritual and be a little bit safer so that's definitely a cool thing you can add in it also can just make it very easy to protect your base from a lot of bad guys the one last thing to note, and we're not actually going to show one of these, but they are pretty cool, is that you do get one additional mini dungeon that's added in that will spawn throughout your world that you might come across while you're doing some caving. And it's going to contain both regular dungeon chests in it with vanilla loot, and then it's also going to contain Eidolon chests in it, which will have some pretty cool Eidolon pieces of loot that I would definitely snag if you come across them. It's not super dangerous, but it does look pretty cool. And there may be one or two rooms big, so if you find one of those definitely give it a look and see if you come across anything super lucky in your chest so now we've gone over pretty much all the things that you will come across naturally in the world and we can move into the second chapter of the book which is rituals and there's a ton of different rituals to go over but first we're going to go over how you actually conduct these and the different blocks that you will use to set them up so there's three different types of blocks that you will need to begin conducting these rituals. The first one is right here, and this is the brazier. Now this is going to be the central focus point for all rituals, and you're going to place an item in here and eventually light it on fire with a flint and steel, and this is going to be how you initiate a ritual. Now some rituals will just be a one-off, and they will finish whenever they're done with what they're doing. Others will be persistent, and you are able to put them out by right-clicking with an empty hand on the currently lit brazier, and it will stop whatever it's doing. On top of that, you're going to need some assisting items, and those are going to be placed in one of the two different item receptacles that we can see around the brazier, the first one being the stone hand. This is a very simple one. All you're going to do is right-click on it with whatever item you want to put in there, and it will hold on to it until the ritual is actually being conducted. Then the item will be pulled from it and consumed for the ritual and you can right click and take the item back out in case you perchance place the wrong one in there or wanna switch up whatever ritual you're planning on doing. You'll need varying amounts of these depending on what ritual you're actually conducting. And then the second more specialized item receptacle that functions very similar to a stone hand is right here. And this is the necrotic focus. Now there will be certain rituals and we'll discuss them in a couple minutes that are going to require a necrotic focus instead of just a stone hand as they are going to be able to have a ton of different rituals that are very similar and you will need to specify which specific one of those many you actually want to use. So one example that we'll be going over is the ritual of summoning different mobs and then you are going to use the necrotic focus to essentially specialize in what mob you actually want the ritual to summon. So these are a lot less common, but you still will need to use them in certain rituals, and they honestly look pretty cool compared to the stone hands. So now that we know the basics of how to actually set these rituals up, we can start going over specific ones, and we're actually going to quickly go through all of these just to let you guys know what they do and how to set them up. And the first one where we are really going to specifically go over it, just so you guys understand what all the visuals mean and how it works, is going to be the basic crystallization ritual. This is pretty much the first one you'll use. It's the simplest one to do. And as we see right here, you have the sort of visual of the brazier and it's going to have bone meal placed in it. And then right here, you've got two redstone dust. These are both going to go in stone hands. As you can see, they just have sort of light circles around them and that's what that indicates. Now, once we light this on fire, we're going to get this symbol right above the brazier. It will initiate it. And what this ritual actually does is it's going to harvest the soul of any undead creature that is nearby, which means it is going to leave 
uh, one to three soul shards in their place. And soul shards are going to be used for a lot of different things with this mod. And so this will be your first way to actually go about sort of farming soul shards. There will be easier ways down the line with a lot of the items you get, but this will be one of the main ways you go about doing that to sort of progress with future crafts. So as you can see, we have the bone meal, the two redstone in the stone hands. So all we need to do is light this with a flint and steel and it will start conducting the ritual. So you can see all we do is right click on it. It starts burning. We will get the symbol that right up there that we saw. It's going to suck both the items in and it's going to kill this guy right here. You get a little noise when it's done and we are going to get the one to three soul shards dropped from it. So again, this is how you're going to go about getting those early on. And this is the simplest ritual to conduct. Now, the next one, if we look, is going to be the Ritual of Lesser Summoning. Now, this is the one I was mentioning earlier, where it can be used for a ton of different mobs. So you've got Zombie, Skeleton, Phantom, Wither Skeleton, Husk, Drowned, Stray, and the Wraith. So whichever one of those you want, they're all going to be relatively similar. You can see the Charcoal is going to be the one on the Brazier. You're going to need a Soul Shard, which of course you will need to have gotten from the prior ritual. And then you're going to need two other items that will be related to the monster you're trying to spawn. Now, as you can see, the one on the far right still has a circle around it. So today we're going to be spawning a zombie. So the soul shard and one rotten flesh will be in the stone hands and the charcoal will be in the brazier. But right here, this visual for the middle rotten flesh is indicating that you need to have it placed in the necrotic focus. And this is what's going to specialize the ritual to specifically indicate that you want to summon a zombie versus anything else. So important to make sure that you actually have it placed in there. We can see we have everything set up right here. So if we were to light this on fire, again, once it burns, we're gonna get the symbol in the sky. It will consume all of these and we will get a zombie friend that'll be chilling with us and unfortunately is going to be lit on fire and have to die a horrible death. And you can see they spawn right on top of the brazier. And there you go, buddy. Unfortunately, you're gonna have to die for us to have a nice tutorial today but we can move on because we're not the ones that are dying right now. We're just having fun lighting stuff on fire. So the next one that we are going to go over is going to be the Ritual of Alluring. And I think this one is pretty cool. Uh, the Ritual of Alluring basically is going to bring a bunch of animals from a wide radius into you. So it'll be really useful if you need food or, you know, if you're a vegetarian, maybe you can make friends with some of the chickens or something and talk about how hungry you are. I don't really know what to tell you, but with this one, we are going to need a rose bush, two soul shards, two red dye, and a golden apple. No necrotic focus needed, which is awesome, but as you can see, we need a lot more stone hands than we would have needed for the prior rituals. And if we were to light this on fire, hopefully we got some guys around here that will be drawn in. So we'll see with that pig right there. So these guys are all gonna get consumed and we should start seeing once it's done, some of our nice friends running towards us. So over the next period of time, these passive monsters or the, the animals, I should say, will be drawn towards where the ritual is actually conducted. So this should make it a lot easier for you to actually track down food or if you need things like wool or leather or anything like that, this will be a good one to use for that. The next ritual that you're going to be able to do will be the Ritual of Repelling. And this one is basically the exact opposite of the Ritual of Alluring. It is going to drive away any monsters that are nearby. And so again, this one is not going to need a necrotic focus, but it is going to need a Nautilus shell on the brazier, two soul shards, a nether quartz, leather, and an iron ingot. And so if we're gonna light this one, we'll see again, the symbol will appear. All of these will be consumed, nothing new and it will be a persistent effect ritual that will drive hostile monsters away from you and hopefully keep you safe. So again, I think this one's actually pretty useful if you wanna leave it running at your base uh, as it will hopefully protect you from any bad guys. Now the next one we're going to cover is going to be a little bit different than the other ones. This one is going to be the ritual of deceit. 
And this again does not require a necrotic focus, which is awesome, still requires five stone hands, but this is going to make it so that villagers that are nearby sort of forgive you a little bit faster because, go figure, they're not really a fan of people that are practicing the dark arts and performing rituals and sacrifices and things, especially because some of those sacrifices are going to involve them and all their friends and family later on as we progress through this even further. So to do this, we're going to need two emeralds, a fermented spider eye, a red mushroom, and two soul shards. So we got that right here. And if we were to light this, again, this ritual would actually go on. So we'll get, I, I really like the symbol on this one, honestly. Um, but this ritual would occur, and it will make the villagers around here be a little bit nicer to us, considering we are going to be sacrificing their friends. Uh, now, obviously, we're able to see right here a perfect example of how because there was... Uh, two soul shards over here and two over here. It actually consumed one of the ones over there. That's no problem. All we would have to do is simply grab this one from right here and we can put it back down over here for the next ritual that we are going to be conducting. So the next two rituals we're going to go over are very similar, and I also find these to be very useful. These are known as time rituals. And so there's a ritual of daylight and the corresponding ritual of moonlight. Both of these have very similar requirements for the rituals, and it is going to make it either daytime from nighttime, or it's going to make it nighttime from daytime. So I'm sure you can think of many times where this would be useful when you're playing modded Minecraft. And so the first one for the ritual of daylight is going to need a sunflower, two soul shards, wheat seeds, and charcoal. And now we got all these guys around here bothering us because we did the ritual of alluring. Uh, but for this one, if we were to light it, it would make it daytime, but it's already nighttime. So a perfect example would be to actually come over here. And if we look at the ritual of moonlight, this is going to need black dye, two soul shards, a spider eye and a snowball. So if we were to light this one, it will make it nighttime. And then we can use that one to revert it back to daytime so that we can actually continue recording the video and everyone can actually see everything. So we'll let this one run and we'll actually look at the sun because once it starts working, you will see it quickly accelerates and moves it so it is nighttime and then it's completed. Now, if we wanted it back to daytime, all we have to do is come over here and light this one and it'll consume these and revert it back to daytime once it's done, which is great because we wanna actually have a nice time to record the video. So we'll let it go and we'll get to see the moon just speed across the sky. I think the visuals for this are super awesome. And there we go. Now it's daytime again, and we're good to move on. So the last ritual that we are going to specifically be going over is going to be the ritual of purifying. And this one is going to allow us to cure any undead inflicted mob. And so that's going to include things like zombified villagers, zombified piglins, and hoglins, and they will be restored to their former selves. So we have our trapped zombified villager right here and all the different stuff that we need for the ritual of purifying. It's going to be a glistering melon slice, two soul shards, a potion of healing, and two enchanted ash. So we've got that right here, and if we were to light this, we'll be able to see it consume the glistering melon, all this good stuff, and hopefully this guy right here will be reverted to his former self and be a little bit less hideous looking, admittedly. Uh, so enjoy your last seconds of being undead, and there we go. So he's been reverted back to a regular villager and because of that, he's able to walk across the enchanted ash as he's no longer undead. Now the final and most complex rituals are going to be used to make these two items right here, both of which are pretty darn cool. Now this one is going to be the Sword of Sapping and this one is going to be the Sanguine Amulet and each of them have pretty interesting effects. So we can see here that the Sword of Sapping, it's got this relatively large uh, ritual to make it and it is going to require an Iron Sword as the item in the Necrotic Focus. It also needs two Nether Wart, a Gas Tear, two Soul Shards, a Shadow Gem which we will get to making later, and a Potion of Harming. And this is going to convert the Iron Sword to the Sword of Sapping, which is going to be a regular weapon, but on top of that, it's going to deal Wither damage in addition to its normal attack damage, and any of that Withering damage is going to heal the person who's using it. So on top of actually needing all these ritual requirements, which is a lot more than any other one, it's going to need 10 hearts worth of a living creature nearby for the ritual to actually consume to imbue into the sword 
to make it the sort of sapping. So it's going to require definitely a lot of stuff, but it's a pretty cool item. Now the next one is going to be the Sanguine Amulet, and this one's very similar. It's going to have a very large ritual with the Potion of Harbing in the Brazier, four redstone dust and stone hands, a lesser soul gem, which we will also get to how to get later, a diamond, and a basic amulet. And this will upgrade the basic amulet to the Sanguine Amulet, which will store regenerated health when you are at your max health, and then use it to heal you pretty quickly as you start taking damage. On top of this one's actual ritual requirements, it's going to need 20 hearts worth of living creatures right near the ritual to consume to imbue into the amulet to make the sanguine version. So this one needs even more than the other one, but I think the effect on this is super powerful and it's definitely a cool item. So that's going to finish up the rituals section for now and we can move on to the next one, which is artifice. So for the artifice section, there is a ton of stuff to cover. If we look in here, we can see that there's a lot of things that we can craft, and then eventually those things will be used to make a ton of the gear that is listed here at the end. So we'll be going over all of this, but the place you are going to start out is with the crucible. Now this is going to be made using some of those pewter ingots we talked about earlier. It's a very simple thing to craft, but to make it actually function, you're going to want to place it down with a heat source below it. You can see we just have a fire and then you're going to put some water in it. So if we are to grab out a water bucket, we can simply click it in here, we'll fill it up, and then after a couple seconds, we will notice that particles start coming out of here that look like bubbles to indicate that the water is now boiling and it's good to go. We can use it for any crafts that require the crucible. So if we look in the Ecclesia under the artifice section, majority of the stuff listed on this first page is going to use the crucible. Things like arcane gold will have their recipes listed here. And on the right side, you can see what a crucible recipe looks like. It's gonna have multiple steps. You're gonna add them in in sequence, and then you're going to pop out your final item. Now certain recipes will require more or less components. They will have more or less steps. And certain things can be relatively complex. We'll go over one in a little bit. But you're basically just going to throw these in there and eventually you'll pop out your final item, assuming you do it correctly and it will consume the water. Now, a lot of these items that you will make in the crucible, such as arcane gold or some of these reagents that you can see right here, and there's quite a fair bit of them that we can go through, but those will be used to make a lot of these different items on the last couple of pages. So if we click on some of these, we can see that some of the different things that we will see in the beginning of this page for artifice are going to be used for making some of these. So things like the lesser soul gem tend to be very common. We've got calx of the end here, multiple things which are all listed in this section. So making sure you understand how the crucible works is gonna be key in progressing to the later portions of the items that come along with this mod. So to give you guys an example of how the crucible works, we are going to be making the soul gem right here, the lesser soul gem, which you saw we used in some rituals earlier. And this one is going to allow us to show you how to do multiple steps and also what this visual means in step two, which is the stirring visual, because some of these have it a lot easier. You just throw things in and let them process. But with this one, you actually need to also stir it. And this is an area where a lot of people can mess it up. So we're gonna grab out the redstone and lapis for the first step, the soul shard for the second step, and we'll make sure we have all of it in our hot bar right here ready to go. And what we're gonna do is quickly make sure we throw all of these in, they need to be in the right order, and after every step you wanna make sure the items are consumed and the color of the liquid changes, but you do not wanna let it sit for too long because if you do, it's going to just burn whatever's in there. Uh, the water won't ever burn, but the minute you convert it to something else, it will potentially burn if it's in there for an extended period of time. And that's pretty much like five or 10 seconds without you doing anything. Uh, and you'll lose everything you've put into it so far. So what we're gonna do is quickly throw in the redstone and the lapis. We'll watch it get consumed. Then we are going to, the minute it changes color in here, throw in the four soul shards and stir it quickly twice by right clicking. You can see it changes color and then we throw in the nether quartz and finally it'll make a nice noise and it'll kick our lesser soul gem right out to us. So that is one of the more complicated ways to do this. You will need to put more water in it if you wanna use it again, but hopefully that'll make it very easy for you. As a lot of the other ones, things that are more commonly used like the arcane gold, don't even require stirring or they only have two steps. So shouldn't be too complicated to make things like that. 
Now, the next thing that we are going to be going over is gonna be the apothecary brewing. And we can see right here that this is the apothecary stand. It looks very similar to the regular brewing stand, but this one is going to be able to be put right on top of a heated crucible. And if we look at it, you can see that it's marked as being heated right here in the bottom left of it. So if we look down here, this one is not placed on top of the heated crucible, so this one is not marked, but this is going to allow us to not use blaze powder when making potions, which is super nice if you're low on that. Unfortunately, the apothecary stand is not going to allow us to increase the power or duration of potions, so it does have a little bit of a drawback. But if you're gonna use this, you wanna make sure you put it on top of a heated crucible. Now, one other thing to go over that you can make but actually isn't made in the crucible is tallow. And this is gonna be used essentially just in making candles, which will come in handy later on, and we will discuss that. But it's simply made by putting rotten flesh into a furnace, and you are going to get out tallow, and that'll be used to make candles, which will be used in the theurgy section of this mod. Now, we also have right here the enchanting. This is the soul enchanter. It looks very similar to a regular enchanting table, but it's going to allow slightly more deterministic enchanting at the expense of soul shards, which you can see can be put in right here. Now, because we're in creative right now, I'll be able to show you guys this without actually having to expend levels or soul shards. But essentially, when you put an item in here, you are going to be able to expend experience and get a selection. You can see right here, we've got fortune, efficiency, and unbreaking. So all the stuff that you could potentially want on a pickaxe. And as we put these on, we will be able to then level it up. So here you can see we've got fortune one. Well, now we can get fortune two. Now we can get efficiency one. Now we have the option of upgrading fortune or doing unbreaking. Let's get unbreaking. Let's get fortune three. And if we just keep clicking through this, eventually we have nothing left. But if we look at the pickaxe, we now have fully maxed out pickaxe with fortune three, efficiency five, and unbreaking three. So this is a super cool way to max out your items as you will be able to continue leveling each enchantment up on them by one by expending experience and soul shards. So another reason that it's super useful to farm soul shards, I think this is one of the most useful things that comes with this mod. It's absolutely awesome and makes enchanting stuff so much less painful and can seriously allow for some overpowered tools and weapons. Now, along with this, you're also going to have a ton of gear that's going to be included in this section, and you're going to make this using the magic workbench. Now, the magic workbench is relatively simple to make. It is going to be some pewter ingots, some oak planks, and some red carpet, so it's nothing too fancy, but similar to astral sorcery, this is going to give us a slightly larger workbench to work with. So it adds in four slots, which we will see in the later crafting recipes are gonna be required for crafting a lot of magic recipes. On top of that, it can also be used as a simple regular crafting table, so you can just replace your regular one with this, and it will also be able to function as both of those. So for all the future crafting and stuff in here that we will be going over, you can use that. Now each of these things are going to be special magic items. A lot of them are going to go in the curios slot that will come along with this mod. You need to have curios installed to actually use this mod. And so these will fill up some of those slots like the charm slots and the belt slots. So the first one is going to be the void amulet, and this is going to be an amulet that when you wear it is going to protect you from projectiles, but it's gonna have a cooldown. so once it works, it's gonna take about 10 seconds to actually function again. And you can see here, this is where it starts using those additional four slots where you're going to use the top and bottom one for soul shards. You're also going to have warded mail, and this is basically going to provide extra defenses against magic attacks, and then whatever armor is worn over it is going to be more powerful against the attacks than they normally would be. On top of that, we're also going to have the soul fire wand and the bone chill wand. The soul fire wand is going to be a wand that actually attacks by firing magic bolts when you use it. The bone chill wand is going to be used uh, to apply the chill debuff that the wither applies to different monsters, preventing them from healing. The Reaper Scythe is a pretty cool item. This is going to be a pretty powerful weapon that allows you to more easily harvest soul shards as whenever you kill monsters with this, its soul is going to be crystallized, giving a more active method of actually harvesting soul shards rather than performing the ritual. The next one is going to be the Cleaving Axe, and this is really just a super powerful weapon. You can see it's very slow, but it has super high attack damage. 
And this is going to be very useful for decapitating enemies and getting their heads. And that's going to be useful in the theurgy section where monster skulls are going to allow us to power stuff up. After that, we're going to have the Pickaxe of Inversion. This is a pretty funny item, I think, because it's gonna make it so that harder blocks are mined faster and softer blocks are mined slower. So that's definitely an interesting one. Then you're going to have Warlock Armor that consists of the Warlock's Hat, the Warlock's Cloak, and the Warlock's Boots, which all give decent armor values, but on top of that, they're going to increase your magic damage when using the Warlock Hat. They will decrease the amount of magic damage you take with the Warlock's Cloak, and with the Warlock's Boots, they will prevent you from having reduced movement speed, and you'll become immune to the slowness effect. So, these are all pretty handy to have, they all have their own effects, but they make you pretty strong. You then have the Gravity Belt, which is going to make you have reduced falling speed, and it's going to quarter fall damage, so you'll hopefully die a lot less from jumping off things like an idiot like I usually do. You'll have the Prestigious Palm, which is going to be a charm that allows you to have twice as long your reach when it comes to placing blocks and attacking things. You're going to have the Mind Shielding Plate, which is going to make it so that you continue to keep three quarters of your experience when you die, and you will have immunity to the Nausea effect. The last one that you're going to have for the belts is the Resolute Belt, which is going to both negate and reflect any knockback attacks you have on you. And finally, the one that I think is the most interesting is the Glass Hand. This is a pretty dangerous one. It's going to make it so that all damage you do is doubled, but all damage you take is quintupled. So, if you want to be totally Glass Cannon in Minecraft, this is how you're going to do it. Uh, so I think that's definitely pretty cool if you have super overpowered armor from a mod and you want to just double up on the damage you deal because you don't care how much you take because you don't take any, well, this will be a way to do that. And that's going to be it for all the different items that are added in. And again, these are going to fill up if we go in. We can see the curios slot right here. You've got your charm, your belt, your rings, your body, your necklace, and your head. These are the slots that are going to be filled up by all those different items. So now to move on to the theurgy section of the mod, and this is going to be the later game portion of it. This will be the fourth chapter here, but it's also going to use the mystical signs that we will discover. And this section is based around using different signs in different combinations to perform chants, which are basically like magical spells or prayers. And you will be either performing sacrifices to a deity or praying to the deity. And this will allow you to advance and gain more knowledge of the dark arts. So to start out, you will end up using something like this. This is going to be the wooden altar. And you can make it any size or shape that you want. Right here, I just made it a 3 by 2 Because this will probably be the size you end up going with. As you're going to end up placing items on here to max this out. And you don't really need anything bigger than this. And then you're also going to need an idol in the center. So this is going to be the wicker idol right here. This will be the one you start out with, but you will both be upgrading the material the altar is made out of and the idol itself. So over here we have what you will eventually get to, and this is the more advanced version of it. So this is going to be the stone altar and the elder statue, which also functions as an idol. You are going to need an idol on the altar if you wanna perform any chance, as you need something to chant to, but you're gonna be able to upgrade to this, and these do not inherently make this any more powerful if you perform lower level chants, but you are going to require these for some of the later game chants that we will get into, and the wooden altar and the straw effigy are not going to be sufficient. So over here, this is what a fully upgraded altar is going to look like. If we look in the Ecclesia, you will see that there are three different categories of things that you can use to upgrade. So you have altar lighting, you're going to have altar skulls, and you are going to have altar herbs. And you can see that each of these listed on the right page will have power and potentially capacity bonuses. And so these are going to enhance both the power and capacity of your altar. The power is going to be the power of your prayers or sacrifices, allowing you to progress even faster. And the capacity is going to be the capacity that is imbued onto you or an item when you conduct some of these chants. And you can't place multiple of these down on an altar. So whichever one of these sections you place down, so one for lighting, one for skulls, and one for herbs, is going to be picked based on the highest capacity and power 
horror attributes that come along with that. So right here, if you were to have down a skeleton skull and a wither skull, the wither skull would overpower the skeleton skull and the skelly skull would do absolutely nothing. And this prevents it from you just stacking a ton of skulls on top of one of these and doing one prayer and you're all good to go. Now on top of this, you will also have the goblet item. This one is going to be used when you perform sacrifices, whether it's an animal or a villager, what have you, where you require blood of some creature to actually perform. The blood will be collected in the goblet if the thing is slain nearby, and actually having a goblet on the altar will also increase its capacity by two. So it doesn't specifically give you the same sort of indication on the right here, but it will make your altar more powerful. So right here, this is what your upgraded one will look like. I think it looks pretty cool. It very much so reminds me of witchery. And now we can go over how to actually progress with the different theurgy, the different chants you'll do, and the mystical signs. So we're just gonna start out, I'm not gonna go through all of them and how you actually get to them because it's basically just repeatedly doing this stuff every day. You can only conduct one of these per day, so you're gonna wanna make sure that you start out pretty early on. And we're first going to grab out our, where is it, we'll do our villager spawn egg, and we need to grab a witch because you need both a cleric and a witch to start off with this. So first off, we'll put down the witch and we will throw them, if they want to stand still, our Ars Ecclesia. Okay, well apparently they just want to continue running away from us and laughing. Uh, but there we go, we threw them the Ars Ecclesia and eventually they will toss it back. There we go. And if we pick it up, it says we unlocked the wicked sign. So that's how you unlock your first sign, is simply by finding a witch and tossing your Ars Ecclesia to it. And unfortunately, that one was kind of a jerk. They just kept running away. Um, but if we look now, we can see that we unlocked Dark Prayer. And if we look at the mystical signs, we unlocked the wicked sign. And so you're going to use the wicked sign to perform the dark prayer. We'll get to that in a second though, because we're gonna be able to unlock a second sign simply by tossing the book to another magic user, which is going to be a cleric villager. So the way you get this, if you don't know, is you have a villager and you are going to place down a brewing stand and the villager will be converted. Then you're going to toss them again, the Ars Ecclesia. And in a second, they will toss it back just like that, and now we discovered the sacred sign. So if we look here in the mystical signs, that's the one directly to the right of the wicked sign. So these are the first two. These are the only ones you can get by simply tossing your book to a magic user. The other ones we will discover by progressing in the actual mod. So we can go over quickly because we are in creative and are not limited to one per day, how to conduct the prayer and actually get to the next sign. So right here, we have the Dark Prayer, and if we click on it, you're going to perform this chant before an altar to pray to the Dark Lord and attempt to draw their favor. And so to conduct this, we can see that it requires three wicked signs. So if we go to the mystical signs, we click on it once, twice, three times, we build our chant at the bottom of the page here, and we have the option to chant or to clear. So we click chant, we'll hear a noise, and if it all works, you'll hear an explosion and the eyes will light up. So we did it once, nothing happened, let's do it again. Normally you'd have to wait till a second night. So you see we do it twice, and now we've unlocked the blood sign, so this one right here. And if we go back to Theurgy, we unlocked Sacrifice Animal. So this one's going to use the two new symbols that we have, so we're going to do the Wicked Sign, Blood Sign, Wicked Sign again. And to show you guys how to do this, we can quickly do uh, just spawning in a pig. And this is going to require you to, again, have the goblet on top of the altar because this will collect your blood. And we'll just grab out a netherite sword so we can quickly kill the pig. So we'll place him down right here. We will kill him. You can see the blood gets collected in here. Once we have that, all we do is do the chant. We construct it. We do the chant. And now we've unlocked the soul sign and we've consumed the blood in here. So if we look, the soul sign is the next one. And if we look over here, we've unlocked multiple new things. So we've unlocked the touch of darkness, which is a chant that if you are looking uh, at the certain dropped item made of pewter, so the pewter inlay, uh, it will be transfigured and make a new item for you. So we have a pewter inlay right here. All we do is throw that on the ground and then we're going to, if it would actually stay on the ground, we're gonna be looking at that. We can pull this out and see the touch of darkness is going to be the wicked sign and then it's going to be the soul sign. 
So we can do wicked sign, soul sign, wicked sign, soul sign, chant, and then this should get converted. So it gets converted and you can see we now have the unholy symbol. And the unholy symbol is going to be used when it comes to crafting a couple different things. So things like the cleaving ax, the reaper scythe, the elder statue, and wicked weave. So this will be important, especially when it comes to making the elder statue, because the elder statue and the stone altar, which we just unlocked the page for too, if we look over here, are going to be necessary for the final chant that we are going to learn. And so if we want to do this a couple times, we can do uh, a couple different chants. So if we want to do the pewter inlays again, we can do a couple of these and convert them. So we'll just open up the Ecclesia and we will do the chant again for this. And we'll throw down another one. We'll do the chant for that too. And then maybe you sacrifice another pig. Nope, didn't even want to work. Okay, well we'll sacrifice another pig because we want the deity to like us. So there's blood in there now. And if we go back, we can see it's going to be just like this. So we chant, this should explode, and we've acquired new knowledge. So we haven't learned a new symbol, but if we look over here, we've learned Sacrifice a Villager. So this one is going to be a little bit more complicated. We're going to be chanting using three different signs, but we are going to be sacrificing a villager now. So we're going to spawn a villager and kill them. And we're gonna to wanna to make sure we kill them close enough so we can, uh, Maybe trap them in something over here, simply so they can't run away. And so we'll just build up some grass here so we can trap them. But we'll place them down inside here. And if we were to kill them, this will fill up with their blood. And it is able to distinguish between animal blood and villager blood. And then if we wanted to chant, we are going to be doing the blood, the wicked sign, Whoops, the blood, the wicked sign, the blood, and then the soul sign. And if we chant, it will consume the blood again. And we will unlock the final sign, which is the mind sign. Now there's nothing that the mind sign is used for, much like the sacred sign, as you can see over here. But that is going to be coming later down the line. There will be more stuff for you to unlock, more uses for the different signs, more chants. But that is how you're going to progress and unlock all the stuff in here. And that's what I meant when I said there's stuff in here that's kind of hidden. You won't really know how to get there or potentially progress if you don't actually look stuff up. So that should bring you all the way through the mod. That brings us all the way from start to finish on all this stuff. I think it's a pretty cool mod. I'm excited to see what the future holds for it. And so hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. Let me know what you thought, if there's anything you would like different with the format of these or anything, as I do plan on doing a bunch of these in the future for mods that don't totally justify having a Surviving Wiz series with them. Also, I apologize if you guys did not enjoy the cuts, but it definitely makes it a lot easier to report all this information when you're not trying to do such a long video with so much information in just one go. So again, hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. Hopefully you learned a lot and will give this mod a try and I will talk to you guys later.